Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Ed Wood Podcast Summit. This is, uh, I didn't look, I didn't look, honestly, I think it's number 17 in the series. So started doing this earlier this year in January, and we're still trucking along. Uh, this week, I thought, uh, well, I, I got a package in the mail if you've been with us previously here. I'm Greg Javer. If you've been with us here previously, you know that uh, I've done a couple of paperback unboxings, some fishing expeditions looking for old Edwood paperbacks, and that's <laughs> come up largely trumps. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I got a box in the mail this afternoon, and I thought, oh, I could have done a fishing expedition. But I already had planned, had planned a follow up to our previous podcast. So uh, last week at the Edwood Summit podcast, I, in our last episode, I had uh, a gentleman with me, a friend and colleague, Rob Huffman, and Rob and I talked uh, quite a bit about uh, a publisher called France, France, and they published both magazines and books circa 1961 through 63, principally in 62 and 63. So we talked, and I'll refer you back to that because we had an extensive conversation about it, and uh, I want to kind of expand upon that here a little bit this week, and I'll tell you why. So uh, initially, <clears throat> we started talking about this. There were a number of different little clues that uh, had pointed us in this direction to consider the possibility that Ed Wood had, may have written for France books. And this, again, would be some of the earliest known writing that he had uh, published, as far as we know, at least in, certainly in the adult industry. Black Lace Drag, generally, first thing on his resume, adult paperback, and we think Black Lace Drag's where it all begins in terms of Ed and adult publishing. Could very well be, could very well be. But we're looking uh, to sort of uh, kick the tires a little bit on some of the evidence that uh, we came across. And uh, also by, you know, obviously autopsying some of the texts. Let's dig into the texts and try to see what we think. So last week, uh, or in the previous podcast rather, uh, Rob and I went through a whole entire issue of a France magazine called Red Garter, Red Garter issue number one. We talked a little bit about each one of the individual stories in the whole issue vis-a-vis -vis the possibility that Ed Wood may have written it. We also talked about a short story called it Takes Four to Tangle, which was published in a different issue of Red Garter, actually reprinted uh, from an earlier uh, issue of a magazine called Manhood, published by France Magazine. So they reprinted it subsequently in an issue of Red Garter, a different issue of Red Garter than we surveyed. But nonetheless, way, way back in the day, and again, I refer you back to the uh, podcast, uh, Rob will tell you the details. Uh, way, way back in the day, it was part of an Ed Wood group that was pretty uh, active in, in research got his hands on a short story called It Takes Four to Tangle and uh, the information that was actively uh, being uh, sort of batted around in the group was that Ed Wood had written that short story and that they had uh, sort of uh, come to a conclusion or at least uh, thought strongly that uh, Ed Wood may have written other things for France magazines and perhaps even France books. So uh, Rob and I, of course, we promised you at the end of the episode that uh, we're gonna talk more about this and there's more gentlemen who are gonna involve themselves in this journey with us as we go forward over time, because it's not gonna be simple. It's not gonna be easy. It's, uh, it's a tangle. It takes four to tangle. It takes Ed, Ed Wood text to tangle your mind and, and tangle you up in a thought process where you're like, huh, that sounds like it could be. Uh, I'm not really sure. And uh, it's ch it gets challenging. This is all predicated on the notion, of course, that there are works out there that Edward may have written that aren't documented currently. They aren't. They don't show up on one of his resumes. They're not attributed to him uh, legitimately or acceptably, given you know the the feelings of uh, the the so-called experts. So. Uh, <clears throat> By and large, though, I think what we can say, what we can say is uh, I think we feel by and large that uh, much of Ed's uh, work is accounted for. Uh, that being said, there's still things on his resume that haven't turned up. There are things that uh, may have not been on his resume, potentially. How do we know? Right. And uh, I'm not going to talk in depth about all of that. Rob and I talked quite a bit about some of those items last week. But subsequently, after uh, the podcast went up, um, I'm a member of a private Edward Facebook group and I asked people, please make some comments. I'd love to hear what you think. And the first thing people thought was, well, Greg, we wanna read some of the stories so we can uh, try to make a judge judgment call for ourselves. I did put in the, in the article a link to where you can obtain that whole entire issue of Red Garter and you can get it again. You can get a scan of it online for 
uh, you know, pennies on the dollar, so to speak. I think less than $3. You can get it at 30th Street Graphics at their website, 30sg.com. Certainly uh, I, <laughs> not a sponsor of the podcast, but somebody who, whom I know who runs that site is very impassioned about it. And quite frankly, the guys who sell scans of these old paperbacks for a nominal fee, it's hard work. They don't make a ton of money off of it quite clearly. This stuff would otherwise be gone into the ether much of it and uh, we would never see it again so i really appreciate what they do so supporting what they do uh i think is a a good thing uh a good thing because realistically is a copyright holder going to show up and say uh you know the france magazine stories most of which are uncredited or credited clearly to pseudonyms we're going to put them you know put them out in a book (laughs) it's not it's not very likely to happen so uh then again, if it were determined that uh, there was some uh, credence to the possibility that Ed Wood wrote some of this stuff and people could uh, strongly attribute it to him, then there might be interest of that sort. You never really know, right? Even that's a hard dollar, right? Ed Wood, uh, I don't want to say that he had his lightning in a bottle moment in 1994 when the Ed Wood film came out. But real, let's be realistic about this. That's when it leaks into the larger pop culture, to the mainstream culture, and there's a larger awareness around Ed, certainly, and probably in the aftermath of that than there ever was otherwise. I think what that one of the principal values of that, though, was bringing it to light to that extent, put Ed on the radar of a lot more people. So you ended up having a lot more people who took Ed really seriously for a long run since then, which is where I think Rob probably got. In fact, he said it in last week's podcast. He said, I happened to rent one day Plan 9 and the Ed Wood biopic uh, by Tim Burton starring Johnny Depp and I watched the two of them and then I was sold that's how I became an Ed Wood fan so uh, I'm sure he wasn't the only one Uh, nonetheless uh, the other story it takes four to tangle that story is I haven't seen that particular issue of Red Garter or where it was originally printed that issue of manhood available extant online over the course of the last six months at all and I've been looking rather uh, persistently for these items uh, so it's pretty much in extant. So thanks to Rob's good graces, not only holding on to the item, but uh, providing it to me. And thanks also to the original group who started to uh, started to uh, interrogate these texts for scaring it up in the first place. Again, uh, uh, Rob recollected a few of the guys who were in that group and mentioned uh, one or two people on the podcast or some other people who seem to have been instrumental in the group from what I can ascertain. I wasn't a part of it then, not whatsoever, but uh, we thank them. We thank them generously for even even uh, giving a path to travel down. Again, they were not basing it entirely upon just some textual analysis as far as I know. They may very well have been, but we found a few other clues, evidentiary clues that uh, made us prick up our ears in the first place and say, well, what about France? And then Rob remembered this particular short story and remembered that this had passed before his eyes before quite some time ago, literally back in around 2005. So we're revisiting a, perhaps a dead research subject that people may have ultimately walked away from at a point at which they determined that Edward had nothing to do with this. So why do we want to continue to go down this road and say that he may have? Uh, at the time, though, Rob remembers quite uh, pointedly that the determination by these uh, other folks in the group, there was at least some credible uh, determinations that Ed probably was uh, involved in in France and some of the texts had been identified. So I think it, we drew a conclusion at the end of it that was very loose and uh, non-committal for a reason because again we have a lot more texts to uh, surveil and a lot more work to do before I think we feel confident or comfortable to make ultimate kind of hard and fast determinations. Do I have a lean currently in a certain direction? I already said I've been you know pursuing this for about the last six months so I guess you already know what my potential lean may be. I want to set that aside though for a moment. I want to come back. So, so first off I want to pay off the fact that some people in the group said, hey, I want to read, I want to read these stories to evaluate them for, for myself. So you can grab that issue. There was a gentleman in the group who actually posted one of the stories from that issue for the rest of the private group. We were very gracious of him. So some people were able to take a look at it. And in fact, a few people made made a couple of brief comments. So uh, I appreciate that as well. I'd like to see, you know, active dialogue around it so that I uh, see what other people think. I'm really curious to see what other people think. So I'm curious to see what you all think. So in the comment box, drop it in the comment box below the video after what we're going to do today, which is I'm going to read for you story time, Edward Summit story time for the first time. I'm going to read to you It Takes Four to Tangle, the short story, which otherwise I don't think you'd have much opportunity to see. 
and uh, then I'll talk a little bit more again about some of what Rob and I talked about, how, how to break it down, and as well as give you a, a few thoughts on some of the, some of the uh, commentary that some folks we know recently made about it and uh, talk a little bit about that. Not gonna get deeply into that. Today's subject really is just to wanna share mainly the story with you. And uh, it's about 1800 to 2000 words long. So it might take me a few minutes here to kind of poke through it. And uh, I'm not a professional uh, reader of uh, audio books. So forgive me if it's uh, not exactly uh, professionally done. You already know this is the Edward Summit podcast, so we don't aspire to that level of professionalism here. We like the authenticity. So in any case, uh, <clears throat> let's jump into it. So it, it takes four to tangle, and uh, it was published. Uh, we mentioned a name last week. Now I'm looking at the actual document itself, and it was published uh, uh, anonymously. So this was uncredited when it was originally published. So it came up in uh, the first issue of Manhood from uh, 1963. And then it was uh, subsequently reprinted under a different title, The New Girl, uh, in an uh, issue of Red Garter uh, a little bit later in 1963. So let's jump in. It takes four to tangle. The first girl the secretarial agency sent over turned out to be the girl of my dreams. Auburn hair, brushed smooth and flipped back behind one ear. One ear. Alert blue eyes, spackle of freckles across the nose, manner a neat blend of the devilish and demure, but that figure, she had it buttoned into a tailored suit with some idea of looking businesslike, wasted effort, the jacket bulged at the bosom, nipped into a tiny waist and flared suggestively at the hips. The skirt, despite a, a front pleat, rode over rounded knees when she sat down. Paula Trent, you're hired, honey, and never mind the references. Outwardly, outwardly I observed the formalities, introduced myself as Les Murdoch and added that my partner, Vic Banta, was out of town bidding on a new development job. He had the nature of our, had the nature of our business been explained to her? Had the nature of our business been explained to her? Fine, fine. And now, Miss Trent, may I ask why you wish to leave your present place of employment? Certainly, her smile was clear and candid. I don't being lost in a typist pool. I prefer a one girl office where I can use all my skills and training. Lady, you've come to the right place. Use them on me. Careful, though, this is not the kind of doll you can play grabsies with during office hours. Briskly, I continued. Since we're just a two-man outfit bucking heavy competition, the salary will be small to start with. I named a figure. She looked slightly disappointed. I upped it 10 bucks and added, with more to come if you can take over so that I'm free to go out on inspections. She rose, a smooth all-in-one motion with no girdle hitch or attention to a stocking seam. Don't worry, Mr. Murdoch, I'll pay my way and then some. She meant it. Next morning when I pulled up to the, the pink plaster box we call headquarters, it was already open for business. Inside it was clean, cool, the desk neatened up and coffee on. Paula, sleeveless blouse belted in a straight skirt, was busy at the filing cabinet. After a dazzling good morning, she said, there's already been a call for Mr. Banta from, she consulted her phone pad, a Mrs. Helen Doyle. <clears throat> oh, hell her, I said before I thought and smiled feebly. Personal, she'll call again and again. Paula kept her expression expressionless. I found your coffee supplies, but I'm afraid the cream is sour. That's life, I said among us bachelors. Get it, honey, nobody's got me yet, but you've got the best chance I've ever seen. Some of this, the way I'm reading it, I wanna be clear here. Some of it's obviously quotes from Les Murdoch. Some of it is uh, he's talking to himself in, in his own mind, so, uh, just so you understand. Uh, we had coffee together while Paula checked off some items she wanted to know about. At the end, she asked, if there are any more calls for Mr. Banta, when shall I say he'll be back? Too damn soon, I thought glumly, remembering Vic's way with women. We'd met in basic training, been assigned to the same platoon, and ended up barracks mates while serving our hitch. Vic wasn't as big a guy as me, but he was built solid. Tops with the tomatoes, too, to hear him tell it, which figured considering his dark good looks and go-to-hell grin. But I used to wish he'd shut up about it. Not that I'm any gentleman. Us Murdochs come from a long line of Scotch-Irish who know how to kick up their kilts. 
from the same source, I'd inherited an industrious streak. Uncle Sam was entitled to his service, but I meant to see that the time that the time wasn't wasted. I had my own personal plan for discharge day, which required a certain amount of studying. Seeing, with my, seeing me with my nose in a book bothered Banta. He needled me constantly, and when he failed to get a rise, grew curious. One night he bore down on me in my bunk with his usual intent to interrupt. Hey, Les, up and at him. Got a crap game going in the latrine, and your old buddy pal is hot tonight. Bet on me and clean up. I'm going to clean up, I said, in my own time, in my own way, so shove off. Instead, he squatted down, knees cracking, and read off the title of my book, Pesticides, Insecticides, and Fumigants. White choppers showed in a delighted grin. Man, you are buggy. I debated, I debated whether to let him have it or let him in on it. Explaining seemed less trouble in the long run. No, but Southern California is the pest paradise, which is the business I'm preparing for, termite control. I waited for the big guffaw, which didn't come. One thing about Banta, he was adaptable. If he'd been born during the Ice Age, he'd have earned to eat the stuff and thrive on it. <clears throat> Still hunkering, he asked respectfully, much money in it? Well, every time a house is sold, it has to pass termite clearance. And when you figure that the average Californian only stays in one place about three years, that kind of turnover looks good to me. Uh-huh, he fished out his smokes and lit up. Would a guy meet any dolls in that racket though? I shrugged. Plenty of housewives who want their foundations inspected. Our eyes met and we busted out laughing. From then on, he let up on me and I got to like him. Next weekend, we took a pass together. Vic steered me to a beer joint in town where the babes hung out, cushiony cuties with loud laughs, penciled eyes and bushed on hair, or bushed out hair rather, bushed out hair. Okay, if you like your air mattresses, I prefer my dames to have some class. After a while, I slipped out and caught a cab to my favorite uptown bar where I called Dorothy. Dorothy was a luscious little honey blonde with whom I had an arra arrangement. Being a nurse, she couldn't get away too often either. But when our weekends coincided, we made the most of them. No ties, no sighs, a few drinks, a few dances, and we'd retire to her apartment. Our first time together, Dorothy had hung back, sensitive about nurses' reputations for being extra sexy. Just because she knew anatomy, she warned, I needn't expect the exotic. She was not about to spray herself with gold paint and do a belly dance or anything. I told her I surely hoped not, as I would be hard, to, hard put to follow through. Plain as apple pie myself, I liked a girl to act naturally, nature being something I had yet to tire of. Give me a moment, I'm gonna have a sip of my, my beer. We're almost halfway through, so I'm curious to see where you're, what you guys are thinking at this point. Let's go back at it. <clears throat> Freed of the need to put on a performance, Dorothy performed perfectly. She could be by turns docile or demanding, wildly willful or touchingly tender. We made love not by the book, but according to the mood we were in. It was always different and always delightful. And it was again that weekend. I made it to the terminal Sunday just in time for the six o'clock bus back to base. A pink eyed Vic was waiting, teed off that I ducked out on him. What do you care? I grinned. You were in good hands. Lots of them. His eyes narrowed. Yeah, and I suppose you took in an all night movie. I laughed. That's one way of putting it. Vic scratched his scrubby, his scrubby chin. Buddy pal, something tells me I could learn from you. After that, although we stooged together, I took it for granted that we'd go our separate ways, girl, girl wise. Vic did have one talent that I envied. He was money lucky. I brought it up one morning before chow while we were shaving. The way you handle the cubes, you must have plenty in your kick by now. He grinned through lather. Putting the buzz on me? Yeah, for a business loan eventually. I'll need about 5000 to get started. At 7%, it's a good investment. He shook his head. That's my Play-Doh. When I bust out of uniform, I'm heading straight for Vegas. I shrugged. To each his own. Guess I'll have to apply for a GI loan. I think he expected me to be more disappointed. Came the happy day when we were being processed through Repl Depl. Almost out had to report back to base in three days for our final papers. Early Friday, Vic took off with the gang for town. I stayed behind working on my loan application. Dorothy couldn't make it that night, and I didn't feel like promoting anything new at this late date. Saturday night, we met in our favorite booth at our favorite bar. Dorothy was a little distant, not sore exactly, but feeling the coming parting like women do. What could I say, that I'd be back to marry her? I knew I wouldn't. She was a sweet kid and swell in bed, but with me, it just didn't go any deeper. 
I was just getting her thought out when who should show up but Banta, all spit and polish on his best behavior and ever so surprised to run into you. Nothing to do but buy him a drink. He sat and nursed it while his eyes nursed my nurse. It was quite a performance. He charmed her with compliments and clean jokes. At first, when Dorothy played up to him, I figured it was just to punish me. But pretty soon, I could feel her really responding. Finally, I excused myself and went to the can to figure out how to shake him. A real stupid mistake, because when I got back, they'd flown the coop. Well, I could have gone to her apartment and beat the door down. But like I said, with Dorothy and me, it was no ties. She had a right to change partners if she felt like it and Banta knew how to make her feel like it. I spent the night on a bench in the bus station and was still around when the guys started straggling in the next day. Banta arrived when we were all out on the, cr on the crowded platform waiting to board. He elbowed up and stood in front of me, wary eyed, but smiling. Told you I learned fast. Yep, I said. No hard feelings then? Nope, I said, and hauled off and hit him in the mouth. He flung out his arms and fell back into a bunch of GIs who happily shoved him upright and ringed around for the fight. I handed to Vic, he was still smiling, but more vertically than horizontally now with that split lip. For added chuckles, I busted him in the eye. Then someone yelled, watch it, MPs, and everybody melted into the bus, leaving us a couple of candidates for the guardhouse. But Vic acted fast, lowering his head. He butted me onto a bench, dropped me beside, pulled his cap down over his eye, placed his head on my shoulder and started snoring. A couple of MPs charged up and stomped around glaring. Nothing to see, Vic snored away while his lip bled gently into my shirt pocket. Back at base, he sat docilely on his bunk while I taped his lip and doctored his eye. Then groaning, he bent to unlace his boots. One moment. <clears throat> Here, let me help, I offered, hating myself for being the one to feel guilty. He shook his head, and I grumbled. It's your own damn fault. Never even put up a fight. I stopped, puzzled. Vic had pulled off a boot and was ripping out its insole. From under it, he took a layer of greenbacks, mostly large denominations. Same with boot number two. When he had a, when he had a lap full, he looked up at me and grinned. Black eye, white lip and all. Here's your five grand and then some, but there's a catch. He thumbed his chest. Me, I want in full partner. Yeah, buddy pal, I cried and grabbed his hand. It had worked out fine, Vic the old promoter dragging in new accounts while I handled reports and estimates until I got restless under too much paperwork. Well, now we had an office girl, but the girl was Paula Trent, which made the difference. I half wished Vic had never come back. He did though on Friday, just before quitting time. Paula was in the little lavatory and back, fixing up for our dinner date. With luck, I hoped Vic would take off and leave me one more lovely evening before I had to spring her on him. But he was disgusted from no sale and bound to talk about it. Cheap jack builders, he fumed. I tried to sell him on preventative control, at least spraying the subsoil before they throw up their cracker boxes. But oh no, let it turn into another termite terrace. He paused and glanced around. Say, what have you done to the joint? It looks different. His eyes lit on a vase of flowers on my desk. And at that moment in the lavatory, a tap was turned on. Oh, his look was amused and aware. The woman's touch. I stood up feeling I had to make it formal and final. Vic, I've done a lot of chasing, same as you, but this is it. Her name is Paula Trent and she's, well, I mean, I'm hit. He spread his palms. So what do you need, references? I hadn't got it across, who could with Vic? To him, love was just a game that any number can play. I was sunk and I knew it, even before the door opened and my precious Paula walked in. The next weeks were miserable, watching him move in. It was the Dorothy deal all over again, only played with more finesse. He laughed it up, joking and kidding her, and Paula paid him back in kind, like the high-spirited filly she is. Somehow our dates turned into threesomes. I got to take her home is all. Those good nights parked in front of her house were the worst torture cuddles and kisses when I could hardly keep from taking her, but I wanted to go easy so she'd know I really mean it. One night I couldn't stand it any longer, her in my arms, round and warm and sweet, deep kisses that promised so much more. Paula, I blurted, I've got to know. Which is it, Vic or me? She froze, then pulled away. I pulled her back. Sorry, honey, it's just that he is such a likable guy and you two seem to get along so well together. Don't apologize, she said crisply. My fault for breaking the rules. They taught us in business school never to get mixed up with the boss. Causes trouble, big trouble between partners. She paused. Maybe I should find another job. 
well, it scared hell out of me. I was all set to ask her to marry me. Now I figured that would be rushing it. Not enough groundwork laid. Baby, I took her face between my hands. You stick around, see, because I love you. Intentions strictly honorable, and in time I'll prove it. Her eyes glittered oddly. Is time all that's required less? Then with a sigh, all right, we'll see. Next day I had it out with Vic, or tried to. We just sprayed an empty house with methyl bromide, locked up and posted the warning. As we climbed back into the pickup, I said, you realize this is the first job in a week? Vic shrugged, so business is slow. It'll pick up. Not with you hanging around the office instead of out hustling. He grinned, same to you, sweetheart. Damn it, Vic, lay off. I'm serious about Paula. His eyes hardened. How do you know I'm not? I snorted because there's still Mrs. Helen Doyle, divorcee and bar hostess supreme, among others. Vic snapped his fingers. Hey, that reminds me, Helen's got money down on a duplex, figures to live in one side, rent the other, and wants us to do the termite inspection. Wants you to. Man, this is business, like you're hollering about. And you know me, gift a gab, but can't tell a bed bug from a flying ant. Let's say I call her for you and you make the arrangements. Oh, hell, I said hopeless, hopelessly, and nothing was settled. I just have to rely on having the inside track with Paula and possibly picking up more speed. Two days later, I met with Mrs. Doyle at the duplex, at the duplex in the Los Feliz district, district. Met her for the first time and was, I admit, pleasantly surprised. Vic's taste had improved all right. This was a sex pot of the superior sort, a statuesque brunette, silky hair slicked back in Spanish style. The chassis was cleverly contained in a black sheath that did nothing to conceal its curves. Around her shoulders was draped a fur stole, which judging from its mousy color, must have been genuine mink. In fact, when you looked into those wise eyes, you knew it. The lady had been around and would go again if it pleased her. For the first half hour, we stuck to business. The duplex was partly furnished and looked like a fair investment, but I noticed that the floors in one unit sloped slightly. Helen showed me how to get under the house and I crawled around looking for trouble. Found it too, in more ways than one. Every time I glanced out, there stood a trim pair of ankles and the pointed toe of a suede pump was tapping impatiently. I closed my eyes and thought of Paula and how hot it was getting under there. I crawled out, dusted myself off, and we went into one of the units to talk it over. The only furniture was a Davenport, so we sat down together, Helen crossing her knees and me consulting my notes, or trying to. Bad news, I said briskly. The house has no foundation. Mud sills, some evidence of dry rot, which usually means termites too. Besides, I pointed to a door connecting with the other unit. It's a converted job. That means thin walls and no privacy. Then you don't advise me to buy? I looked at her. You'd be asking for it. She smiled and said softly, double meaning it. Maybe I am asking for it. That did it. The weeks of holding off with Paula, fighting Vic and worrying about the business all piled up and went kapow inside. Us Scots are like that. Dutiful and dependable for years on end. Then we suddenly join the Black Watch and go to war. I grabbed Mrs. Helen Doyle by the bun on the back of her neck, which came unpinned and spilled over my hand like warm water. Then her hot mouth was fastened on mine and she was snaking out of her tight sheath. It was short, swift, and savage, the kind of unpremeditated primitive passion, which usually leaves both parties feeling embarrassed afterwards. Not that we had time to take stock. We had barely pulled ourselves together. In fact, I was helping Helen with her zipper when the door connecting with the other unit wanged open and there stood Paula and behind her Vic. My stunned senses were forced to regis register several impressions at once. The first was frame up. Her white face showed that whatever she had come to the duplex to see, it was not Les Murdoch in flagrante. She'd been taken in, same as me. The taker was also obvious, old buddy pal, the fast thinker who had really pulled a fast one. Mrs. Doyle didn't seem any too damn surprised either. In fact, it was Helen Doyle who spoke first, strangely enough addressing Paula. Well, young lady, if you're half the woman I hope, half? Paula marched up and slapped her face. I'm twice the woman you are, and you, turning on me, are more of a man than I thought you were. Although why had why you had to prove it with her when I was ready, willing, and waiting? Honey, I groaned hopefully. You mean you're not sore? You understand and forgive me? I'm furious, pa Paula snarled, taking my hand. I understand that all your brains are below your belt like any man's, and that I'll probably be forgiving you for the next 50 years. As she dragged me to the door, I glanced back at Vic and was pleased to note that he'd finally been put down. His face showed the shock of losing Paula, plus a look of new alarm because Helen was advancing upon him, unzipping her zipper again, 
with obvious intent of taking permanent possession. The end. Dot, dot, dot. At the end, actually ends with an ellipsis. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, catch my breath after reading all that, and then I'll come back and give you a couple couple comments in, in largely in closing. Again, uh, Rob and I talked about this story and uh, gave you some of our thoughts, lining it up with what we thought might be very wood-like. Uh, but I want to talk about a few ancillary uh, related notions. So I shall be back momentarily. All right, back everybody. Back, thank you. I'm going to take a quick moment there to catch my breath after reading through that. Uh, again, apologies, you know, and again, not a professional audio book reader, certainly not by any means, but uh, wanted to share that with you. Could have shared it, obviously, in some other form or fashion, and I probably will put it on paper somewhere, at least for uh, my uh, friends in the uh, private Ed Wood group. But uh, that's the story. So there you have it, you know, and uh, Again, curious to know what people think about it. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the commentary that I got in that private Edward Facebook group about the other story, the story Weird Broadman, which was in the uh, Red Garter number one, which Rob and I talked about. And Rob and I did come to a, a you know, rather, a rather tentative conclusion that uh, this seems like among uh, the stories in that particular issue, the one that might have the most uh, sort of wood-like touches um, in it. And uh, so I uh, got some I've got a quick comment on that. I want to kind of run through these comments really quickly and just comment upon them before we go back to it takes four to tangle. So um, <clears throat> so we're broad man written in kind of a pulpy style. We just heard that in it takes two to tangle, especially with sort of the clipped language, you know, sentences it's trying to give it some sense of action with sentences, sentences just sort of diving right into action verbs and things like that. So um not necessarily ed like it's pulp like right in my mind again this is just my uh, thoughts on it but nonetheless uh, somebody had mentioned after reading word broad man that sounds uh, i get your point it sounds you know get your point why you might think that but it sounds way too well written and uh, i think that's a great point and rob and i had certainly discussed that by the way i did tell rob i, I wasn't going down some uh, rogue path i just wanted to uh you know, run and follow up on our podcast last week, I told him, I said, I'm going to actually share It Takes Four to Tangle with everybody, if you're cool with that, and just make a few few uh, um, additional comments before we get to the next phase of uh, what we, we called in the first podcast, the France Connection, as it morphs into what we uh, may, what may prove out to be the France Revolution. We're going to find that out as we get deeper into this over time. So Rob will certainly be back to talk to me about this again sooner than later and, and probably more often uh, than just once or twice more if he's willing to sit here and talk about all this for hours on end with me. But uh, then we could also, again, I need to do it if you'll uh, indulge me, please, uh, at the end of the uh, previous podcast, we mentioned the Paul Apel drinking game, friend and colleague working on us in the France project, our, our friend and colleague W. Paul Apel, who's here at the Edwood Summit podcast. I just said his name three or four times, I think so. So the drinking game, I have to take a drink for each individual uh, time that his name has been said on a podcast. All right, it's good enough. It's uh, ice beer, so it's got high alcohol content. So Paul, oh, I said it again, whoops. He will give me license, perhaps. Rob would give me license on that score. Um, too well written, right? It's too well written. The quality of the writing style is just higher than what Ed's writing style. That's a very discerning comment, I, I think, by the way. And Rob and I certainly, and uh, uh, another gentleman <laughs> we've talked to about this, whose name I won't mention again, and yet another gentleman. And uh, again, we kind of thought the same thing. Uh, didn't dwell on it necessarily because we uh, sort of thought, well, if you were going to explain that away, let's let's try to accept the fact that there's a possibility. Let's not just try to disprove and dismantle this. Let's accept uh, the possibility that Ed may have written this. Other people have seemed to identify Ed writing in this vein. There's other evidence that says he was there. People who were there said he was there writing for this company at the time. So, uh, so rather than just outright disprove it, how can we be inclusive? So the kinds of thoughts that would come to mind on that score are, uh, well, 
Fran perhaps France had an editorial function <laughs> where Pendulum absolutely did not. When we think of Ed's texts, there's a wide variety of paperbacks by a, a lot of different publishers, but even in that case, many of them clearly, very, very clearly, don't have much of an editorial function happening. Uh, it's whatever was written that ended up being typeset and went to print. In fact, I in in a <laughs> not the fishing expedition box that I got today, but I got a, a GSN paperback a couple of days ago. Um, Golden State News paperback from 1966. And uh, the thing, it was off halfway off the page on the initial page, the printing, and the printing was two thirds of the way up the page on each page forced towards the top. So the margins were extremely uneven. And if you've seen enough adult paperbacks, you've seen this sort of thing where, again, it wasn't like uh, it was being put together at the, uh, you know, the biggest uh, book printer uh, by the by the most prestigious book it's not Tashin books right you know something like that some big prestigious book printer who really prides themselves on this absolutely impeccable sort of product what not whatsoever it was really about could you have a a cover with a sexy image of a woman of some way shape or form a title that was sort of uh titillating or or vaguely sexual euphemistic or as time wore on even more graphically sexual. And then in the text itself, is there enough that uh, sort of sells the idea that it's uh, it's something to read to for, you know, I guess a, a typical guy to read at the time and go, wow, that's really, really something to be able to read something like that. They didn't used to print stuff like that back in the day. Um, <clears throat> It's very quaint, obviously. Having read It Takes Four to Tangle, you could see that now. You can recognize uh, how much uh, overt sexuality did you actually uh, experience in the story It Takes Four to Tangle. If you did check out that first issue of Red Garter, or you did check out Weird Broadman, how much overt sexuality really happens? Very little. Uh, overt actually isn't even the right word for it, because really, if you say that, I, I, I'm not obviously the MPAA, but if it were a film, it might be these stories could very well be close to a G in today's world. I am being a bit facetious, but really there's nothing happening that really you would construe as all that offensive uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, cynical view of human nature perhaps is the most offensive aspect of, this, of the stories. And that just goes for, I think, pulp generally. But uh, in any case, uh, well, too well written, lack of perhaps lack of editorial function. Again, just going down the list of the, the sort of ability to, uh, to uh, itemize things that keep it inclusive that there's a possibility Ed may have written this. Again, not saying that he did. So um, quality of the writing, uh, perhaps lack of an editorial function. Perhaps again, we're much more familiar again with much of his pendulum writing. Uh, magazine publishing for Pendulum, which was a, a lot more graphic, b, a lot more freewheeling and kind of all over the map in terms of puncture, gram uh, grammar, uh, punctuation, syntax, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, certainly clearly looked like it uh, utterly and completely lacked any sort of editorial hand. Uh, the, the France uh, magazines and books, though, we've gone quite a ways into this now and haven't revealed all the all of our thoughts yet because we have a lot of work to do. But there, there does seem to be a rather consistent editorial hand at work at France, for sure. So is he more so having to write to order to a degree? I think that is a good, really a good segue into another point, and it's another point you could certainly fairly make and say, well, that story you just read me, Greg, it takes four to tangle. There's, there's no angora in it. There's no, there's no cross-dressing. Uh, there's really uh, not a whole bunch of stuff that I heard that sounded to me like uh, that jumps out at me as something that Ed Wood might have written. That, that, first off, I think is a fair statement, and we've thought about that ourselves and thought especially about uh, when it comes to uh, not only one story, but wider, uh, a wider berth of material that we've surveyed and kind of come to the conclusion, I mean, you know, there is a distinct lack of Angora here, right? So is that damning? Does that mean Ed didn't write it? Certainly, again, if we go back to Pendulum, if you've re read a lot of his Pendulum stories from the, the early 1970s, or even his paperbacks generally, his paperbacks do often and, and nearly without fail, as a matter of fact, include a, at least a mere mention of Angora, not so necessarily in the short stories. It depends what they were written for, not so in the articles he wrote for the Pendulum magazines. So uh, 
I still think it's a really, really compelling point. There's other keywords certainly that are specific to Ed. And uh, as we go deeper down the, uh, the road towards the potential France Revolution, we'll get deeper into that. Jim Pontalillo, who was here a few podcasts ago, we talked about uh, a little bit about textual analysis around Ed. And uh, we're going to talk actually more about it at some point in the near future, not only vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the potential France Revolution, but just more generally. I'll, I'll let you guys know what that means at the end of this podcast when I sort of give you a little bit of a preview of uh, some of the subsequent topics that we're going to be covering in the very near future here at the Edward Summit podcast. So um, we've got quality of the material. We've got keywords, sort of signature themes and motifs, you know, and uh, again, no cross-dressing here. There's actually not even a whole hell of a lot of ellipses here in this particular story. And again, that that sort of clipped language sentences starting out sort of uh, a little bit a little bit more clipped to give it that uh, pulpier feel. That's not necessarily something that Ed does commonly. Could he adopt that style if he was trying to be pulpy? Especially could he adopt that style? early on, this is earlier on in his writing career, this is presumably, uh, he would have written this around 1962 or so at the earliest probably, and it's published in 1963. You also have to take into account my personal feeling. I'll take a drink as I say it to uh, sort, of, uh, sort of illustrate the point, perhaps. His drinking, right? His drinking. Come on, let's be real, really honest here. And uh, again, my thought, perhaps uh, by and large, but I did talk to Rob about this, and uh, perhaps I actually spoke to another gentleman about exactly this the other day. Completely unrelated topic. Now that I think about it, but Ed's uh, Ed's alcoholism. Um, he's would be at this particular point in time, if it was written in 1962 or 63, he would be in his late 1930s. That's a a different place than he would be 10 years later, a different place probably than he would be 10 years earlier, especially vis-a-vis, -vis, from what I understand, vis-a-vis -vis the progress, uh, progressive aspect of the disease of alcoholism. So therefore, we're much more familiar. We don't, we don't know of any texts written by Ed in 1962 definitively. We know of hundreds of them, hundreds of short stories and articles from circa and, and many, many paper, dozens of paperbacks, late 60s, early 70s, 1972, 73, the volume of material that he wrote for uh, Pendulum magazines alone is absolutely staggering. Uh, he's in a, obviously a very different place. He's from testimonial, from the sort of firsthand testimonial we get some of in uh, Nightmare of Ecstasy, perhaps uh, actually gives us the most vivid portrait of it that we have. A lot of people were quite, you know, frankly, uh, his colleagues and his friends uh, saw it up close and personal, his decline because of his alcoholism. And he, he presumably by, uh, you know, 1974, 1975, he, he's uh, quite uh, not only uh, starting to, you know, become unhealthy because of it, but it does ultimately kill him. Uh, he dies at the mere age of 54 years old. This is scary to me. I'm 53 years old scary to me to think about that that i don't again you can find evidence if you read not only nightmare of ecstasy but you read other other texts of a wide variety of sorts i remember uh you know well i think it is in nightmare of ecstasy they talk about how he kind of lost his legs wanted to take him to the va but that weekend he died at peter Coe's apartment uh so uh, i couldn't even walk at that point perhaps and uh i remember i believe it was a uh, piece with conrad brooks and it was written it was a newspaper article from the 1990s i don't think i cited this actually at edward wednesdays so real quick i'll go off on a tangent edward wednesdays that's at the uh, d2rights.blogspot.com the dead to rights blog every Wednesday for uh, literally over eight years running now. First, Joe Blevins, the proprietor of Dead right, the Dead Rights blog, great pop culture blog, as well as the founder of that section of the blog, Edward Wednesdays, who started writing there, started writing articles over eight years ago. I started writing articles there. He was gracious enough to loop me into that possibility and opportunity in late uh, 2015. So we've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of articles, but I don't think I cited this particular newspaper article yet. But I remember it being, and I'll have to look this up, obviously, and cite it at some point, interview with Conrad Brooks uh, during the 1990s when in the uh, Ed the cult 
a cult sort of viewpoint of Ed's work was uh, very much at fever pitch during that time frame, this sort of lightning in a bottle moment, perhaps. And uh, everybody was interested in uh, Ed Wood and uh, article in the newspaper interviewing Conrad Brooks. And he talked about how during uh, the latter part of Ed's life, Ed would very often have these little mini heart attacks over and over and over again. I don't think this is the only place I think I've ever actually read that. But again, it, it, if true, and I don't really have a reason to dispute its uh, veracity, if true, uh, he's very ill at a point when he's still a relatively young man, smoked very heavily from the evidence that we have. He and Kathy both drank and smoked quite heavily. And uh, they were adults, and that was obviously their choice. Where what I'm uh, uh, suggesting here, obviously, is that he's in a very different frame of mind and perhaps a, a different uh, different realm of capability in 1975 than he is in 1962 or 1963. I would also submit to you the short story Gemini, which didn't get published for decades until after it was written in an issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland. Uh, Forey Ackerman apparently had a copy of this story because he had at one time represented Ed as his talent agent. And uh, so therefore, he was able to, you know, get his hands on, uh, presumably more than just that one story, Gemini. In matter of fact, this is going to play into the, the, the France angle at some point, exactly what I'm talking about right now. I'm not going to get deeply into that now until we get some of my buddies back here and we can talk more fully about that. But it's an important angle that uh, we will certainly get into. But uh, the st short story, Gemini, which... Uh, was published in Famous Monsters of Filmland many decades later. It also shows up in the now off the market Ramble House book. I think the uh, Shortwood or Horrors of Wood, one of the one of the books that collects short stories of Ed's that Ramble House put out back in the 2000 aughts and uh, ultimately were again, you know, pulled off of the market. So this short story made its way out there ultimately. <clears throat> Read that one, and I have, and I just read it recently. And I think, based on again a number of different timing factors, and knowing that it was in Forey's possession, trying to figure out when exactly did Forey potentially represent Ed Wood, et cetera, et cetera. This is probably it was probably written late fifties, early nineteen sixties, so not a vastly dissimilar time frame to the time frame around uh, when he wrote "It Takes Four to Tangle," or any other material he may or may not have written for France magazines or France books. So uh, read that story and to, to touch on that, the notion of uh, quality of the writing, right? And uh, what he was writing uh, is not only very pulpy, but it gets into almost a little bit ho horror aspects as it gets deeper into it. So, and it's the writing main point here being, doesn't seem, he's not making all these punctuation and grammar errors. Um, there's other things going on, obviously, and it, it takes four to tangle. And I think we've mentioned alliteration. Uh, Paula Trent is mentioned, which is pretty, pretty uh, interesting that the, the secretary's name, the, the main female protagonist is Paula Trent. Um, other aspects, the, the military background of the characters. The one thing that's really, really important to me, and I don't think I mentioned it on our previous podcast, but uh, the, the, uh, one of the gentlemen in the uh, group who had brought this to light, this private Yahoo group back in the day, had uh, made some uh, annotations and, and noted that uh, Ed will often use, and he does it twice, and it takes four to tangle. And I think this is a brilliant point give him all the credit in the world for this again i wish that i wish i could get in touch with this gentleman because i like to cite him by name i'm trying to be respectful and say perhaps he didn't ultimately decide that this was what he thought it was or has moved on and uh, doesn't want to have anything to do with it so i'm trying to be respectful but uh, again if you watch this podcast and uh, figure out you can get in touch with me actually all of you if you want to you can find me on facebook most readily and it's just greg javer g-r-e-g Last name, D-Z-I-A-W-E-R, pronounced Javer, old uh, German Polish phonetic spelling of my family name before it got changed at Ellis Island, in case you're wondering, little personal trivia for you. Um, but uh, love to hear from anybody in that group, actually, uh, to talk about anything related to all of this. But uh, nonetheless, noted, annotated, Ed uses twice in this story and does it throughout his other writing. He uses the word which when we would typically use the word that. So listen for it. Listen, play the story back uh, 
only because now that I've commented a little bit more, think about it a little bit more before you come to a, a, a quick conclusion. If you really want to, right? If you really want to delve deep into this and really take a seriously considered viewpoint on it, you very well may think stone cold first time around. Hey, fuck off, Greg. You're totally fucking wrong. There's no fucking way, man. Ed would had nothing to do with that. And uh, you're, you're delving into stuff that uh, you're only going to create rumors around. Uh, and I don't want to do that, which is why tell me, tell me otherwise. I really want to hear what you have to say. Otherwise there's Chanel barking. So I want to note it because uh, she's always uh, present here at the Edwood summit podcast. And I'm always glad to have her. Uh, uh, my dog, Chanel Nelby, as I call her very affectionately Nelby. So uh, in any case, a little bit more to digest on the subject matter that we were talking about. The witch that, by the way, does bear itself out. If you look at lots of other Ed writing across an even wider swath of time, you will see that he commonly does that. I never noted that specifically until I saw this particular note. And that at which point and subsequently reading anything by Edward, I'm like, yeah, that's brilliant. That's a brilliantly discerning point. Does that mean that there aren't other writers out there or other people who use the word which commonly when most people will use the word that in a sentence? Um, of course there is, right? Of course there'd be other people. So ultimately, I think uh, what you're looking for is clusters of material, not just one little thing that's going to indicate to you, well, that's got to be Edward. You take that and you add to it that there's a character named Paula Trent. You add to it that uh, it happens uh, in a magazine that's uh, published by an imprint and specifically somebody who wrote for that imprint, who we know wrote for France, literally said, I worked with Ed Wood at France. So when you start to add the clusters of material together, that's where we get caught up in the in the arguments and we really start to think hard about uh, his presence in, in these uh, in these um, texts for IPI, International Publishers Incorporated out of Hollywood, California, AKA France <laughs> with the French flag logo always on the cover and always on the uh, spine of the paperbacks additional to that so uh more much more to come we have a long way to go here as we uh, uh the french revolution did not happen overnight quite clearly right <clears throat> i do want to share with you guys as i let me look at my notes really quick to make sure that there wasn't anything else i really wanted to uh get into um Oh, the syntax real quick, going back to that. So I had mentioned on a number of previous, in a number of previous articles at Edward Wednesdays that odd syntax, Ed often adopts this sort of rather odd syntax. And uh, it's that kind of thing, which I was noting, and I didn't know what, I didn't know specifically what I was noting at the time, but little things that are uncommon, like using the word which when others will use the word that. And uh, generally speaking, again, really discerning of one of the gentlemen in the private Ed Wood Facebook group that I'm a, a member of, really discerning of him to say, I think this quality of writing actually is uh, a little higher than Ed would have written. That comes back to uh, um, the complexity of the text itself. And uh, there's, again, much more to come by a gentleman who's far more intelligent than me. Uh, in every way imaginable and is who is going to actually put science to it and i've referenced this a few times so some of you may know what i'm talking about but very soon you will start to see uh, uh some more data around uh really proven out scientifically the possibility again <laughs> right you'll say to yourself well that isn't a hard hard stone cold proof and frankly we'll probably never have it right we're uh, frankly never get the resume that says Edward wrote Weird Broadman. We're not gonna find a manuscript of uh, It Takes Four to Tangle that has Edward's name scrawled uh, somewhere on it. This is just the, very unlikely all these many, many years later that it's going to happen. But we're gonna obviously make a heroic stab at it uh, here at the podcast and trying to discern uh, if Ed did in fact write things that we don't know about, including the magazine article, It Takes Four to Tangle, published in the France magazine, Manhood, subsequently reprinted in another France magazine, Red Garter. So that's a little, uh, little bit more to expand upon what we talked about last week. I hope you enjoy listening to the, the short story itself and sort of uh, asking yourself, could Ed have potentially written this? And uh, then subsequently, 
especially especially if you feel strongly that he couldn't have i really do want to hear that i really do it's not to, uh, to <laughs> drive me off the scent so to speak because that's not likely what's going to happen but i want to factor that in my thinking because again uh my thinking I, i'm trying to always uh by uh, no, well not always recently more so over time trying to bias my thinking in the direction of i want to be inclusive of the possibility it's very different than the path i set off on uh you know uh five or six years ago when i first started writing for edward wednesdays very different where in fact i was on in completely almost the opposite place where i was like there's been a whole bunch of bullshit attributions i used to call them things uh attributed to ed that he absolutely didn't fucking write so i'm sick and sick and tired of people claiming that he did write it and there's actual simple simple evidence that can be found if you research it and dig deep enough to prove that he didn't some of that work actually i've started to actually question as well over time so it is a tangle indeed it not only takes four to tangle but it, it just takes uh two to two to tangle you and an ed wood text and uh tangle with it for it takes four to tangle comment below and let us know what you think my buddies on the edwood uh private facebook group tell me what you think as always we'll report back here at the edwood summit podcast vis-a-vis -vis the efficacy of the potential france revolution in future episodes thank you so i did want to say i i said i'll preview for you so we have some really exciting news coming up here at the podcast the original inaugural edwards summit group uh everybody's all in so i hope they're all able to show up a couple weeks down the road we're gonna revisit the original panel and see see eight months later where our heads are at vis-a-vis -vis edward and it's going to be great to get back together with those guys um more to come on on france quite obviously, potentially, uh, if all goes according to plan, very potentially, could have at least one or maybe even uh, a couple of people coming on the podcast very soon, who I've been uh, talking to, who actually knew and worked with Ed Wood. So that's very, very exciting. So keep your fingers crossed. As always, I hope you found this fun. I hope you found it beneficial. And I hope you return here to the Ed Wood Summit podcast. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.